Our speaker this evening was formerly an Oracle VBA developer for more than 15 years. Please welcome the VP of, D of Data Developer Relationship, Developer Relations for DataStack, and Chief Evangelist of Apache Cassandra, Patrick McFadden. Yeah, I forgot how cool you do these. This isn't just a hangout, man. This is like an event, right? All right, so I'm here to talk about a couple of things, but more importantly, I'm trying to convince you on a thing that may be affecting your life negatively. Um, how many of you would uh, classify yourself as a developer who you writes code for a living? How about someone, how many of you are like just you know, DBA operator in that, that realm? Yeah? Oh, wow, so who, what are the rest of you? Researchers. Oh, what do you research? Neuroscience, Are you studying right now? All right. I want the report when you're done. <laughs> All right. So, okay, that's interesting. All right. So we have a good we have a good mix of developers, operators, and people studying other people. Good. Any other neuro researchers in here? Okay. I feel a lot more comfortable. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so what I'm trying to, oh, I'm going to, what I think I need to convince you about is where Hydro Cloud is going to fit in your world, because it is coming fast, like a train. Uh, Sebastian and I were talking, and there's Sebastian raising his hand. We were talking on the way over, and he's like, "Dude, developers don't really get why this is a problem. Why are you talking about it?" I'm glad you asked that question. But first, let me tell you this, because I love you all so so very much. Um, I want you to come to a Data Stacks Accelerator. I'm going to tell you about some stuff here, but you should come to this because we have 77 talks lined up. And like you heard me talk about before, there's companies like Apple that are going to be there. Um, we have Netflix there that's going to be giving a bunch of talks in Cassandra 4. Um, the Facebooks, the Instagrams, Facebook, you know, they're going to be there collecting your information. <laughs> <laughs> Too soon? <laughs> Uh, but also companies that are doing stuff every day, like Home Depot, you know, Bank of America, ING. So uh, we have a, a really good one of the talks, and it's going to be user to user. Now, you'll see down here, this is why I love you, this discount code, DevRel Free. Uh, I gave a bunch away today, and it really sucked them up. Uh, we, were, we had a Cassandra day today, and man, I put that code up. I got a, a text message from the person who runs our community team, and she's like, what just happened? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're going to try to help me with this. Um, so what does this give you? It's a three-day event. There's a boot camp in the first day for Apache Cassandra development, and then there's two days of conference. We're going to have keynotes from like, companies like Microsoft and Google. Um, we're going to have tons and tons of good sessions, user sessions, um, drones. We're going to have drone racing. Drone racing. Yeah, I know. Um, but more importantly, you're going to be able to meet other people that are doing what you're doing at a really large level. Um, now, that's $800 event. That's what the retail price is. I'm going to give it to you for free because I'm the boss. DevRel, I run DevRel. They said, hey, we need more people from, you know, we're having a contest. Uh, it's like, what, what, what parts of the company can get more people there? I'm like, I know how to get people there. <laughs> but wait, we're not going to stop there. We're also doing certification for administrator and developer on site. We're going to do that for free here. That's normally $300. If you show up, there'll be proctors there. You can do it on site. You're done in one day. 90 minute test. So that also is available to you. So this is worth it. It's a 90 minute train ride to Washington, D.C. from here. You should go. And this is a no-brainer. If you want to do more of this, this is where it's at. All right, so back to the original. And I'll show you that code again soon. All right, so hybrid cloud. Is it for real? <laughs> now, you didn't, if you didn't get the joke, that's a hybrid car with word cloud on it. But I think this is where a lot of developers are right now. It's like, why are you bothering me with the buzzword of hybrid cloud? And I. I kind of get it, and 
and I understand that completely, but here's the problem. And what hybrid cloud really is, is this, uh, this enterprise cloud strategy, has to do with the fact that we're moving quickly to cloud, and as a result, multiple clouds, and a mixture of cloud and on-prem. I mean, we've, we're starting to mix up our infrastructure really bad right now. Um, when I started working in infrastructure, you had one choice, build your own data center. That was it. There was no other choice. And it cost a lot of money. But, you know, that's what we did. That made a lot of good money running infrastructure for a long time. And then uh, later on, you know, there's cloud. Cloud is kind of sketchy, right? I don't know, why would you go on the cloud? Well, it's become mainstream. I was just at reInvent in December. Uh, you know, December. There was 50,000 people there in Las Vegas. It was insanity. So you look around and that's thrilling. So this is what's probably going to happen to you if you're going to be in a meeting and someone's going to pop this up on the screen. It's going to be, here's our iPhone cloud strategy. You're going to want to die at that point because you don't want to hear this. But I'm here to help. I'm here to help. So why is it relevant to you? Someone who probably isn't in the strategy department for running cloud? Well, here's a few things. This is the awkward party question right now, mainly because uh, whenever we ask this question, we don't have a really good answer, or we don't want to answer it at all. Hey, what's your cloud strategy? Uh, well, here's a few answers. So we're all in on one cloud. So this is uh, Roy Joseph. This is reInvent. Uh, He's the, uh, he's, he's got some glorious title, like, you know, Managing Director of Infrastructure, Cloud, and All Things Cool to Blink uh, at Goldman Sachs. And he got on stage and he's like, oh, we are all in on Amazon Cloud. We love Amazon Cloud. You know, Goldman Sachs, we're a total tech company. We're amazing. And, you know, when you hear that, you're like, oh, well, Goldman Sachs just pushed all their chips into Amazon. They're good to go. No, no more to say about that. Um, I put the spoiler alert, probably not, and I'm not talking about Endgame or Game of Thrones. I'm not talking about that. There's too many spoilers. And I haven't seen Endgame, so no one can spoil it, okay? I'm on the road. I can't watch these things. <laughs> Quiet. So here's, here's, here's probably what's going to happen. The five-year migration plan. And this is where you get involved. You're going to love this. You know, year zero, you have to kick off meaning, oh, yeah, we're all in, woo! And then by year one or two, all of a sudden, Amazon does something, and it makes your some part of your company freak out. Like when Amazon announced that they're getting into grocery stores, like grocery stocks, except for Whole Foods, drop like crazy, right? right. Wow, ah, Amazon's getting into insurance, healthcare, all these things that Amazon says they're going to get involved in kills everyone else's stocks, and then you have to reevaluate how are we going to respond to this. Target has this moment. And by year two or three. That original CTO that got up there and said, we're all in on the cloud, leaves. You get a new CTO and, they're like, and that CTO is like, why are we doing this? <laughs> right? That happens all the time. By the end of year three, you're at this point where the old team is completely gone now. The new team is like, oh, man, those guys are idiots. What are they doing? And they look at this infrastructure and they're like, what did they build? This is ridiculous. And then by year four or five, you're like, oh, we're just going to start paying down technical debt. That last team though. this is. Has anyone not lived this? <laughs> right? So this is when I hear, oh, I'm only in one cloud, I'm like, I'm just thinking of this, right? If you hear it's a three-year project, it's, we're building a platform, run! And then this, uh, Google Next. Uh, Google has been kind of like the third place straggler in the back, hey, we're good at search, but do you have a cloud? Well, they came out of Google Next. Did you see who's up there now? They got like the guy from Oracle who's got the best looking suits on the planet, by the way. Uh, but he's, they're like, hey, enterprises, look at all our cool stuff. Check it out. And now enterprise, our IT is like, yeah, yeah, Amazon, whatever. What's up, Google? <laughs> Things change really fast. And then this kind of thing happens, right? Actually, I know people at Target who work at Target. They had to deal with this. What happened? They were all in Amazon. Good, everything's fine, they have some on-prem. Well, then all of a sudden their CEO makes a cloud decision. Guess what? I'm sick and tired of giving Amazon money and when they're our biggest competitor. Screw those guys, we're going to Google. So the CEO made a cloud decision. 
made everyone in the company figure out how they're going to get off Amazon. And then there's this one. We're never going to be in the cloud. I'm not even going to address that. Because every time I hear that, I'm like, yeah. Because <laughs> there's all these things. But here's the thing I see a lot. Is this the little bit of cloud? Oh, here's the deal. Now we're going to do, we're only going to run dev and test in the cloud, right? Because slow, low impact. We don't need security and all those things that we don't go to cloud for. And then I have this thing that I call cloud linkage. Whoops. Hey. Cloud linkage is when one or two rogue groups, like they don't want to call the IT department or the ops team to get some servers in the on-prem. So they just like give the credit card over to Amazon and then they start spinning up infrastructure on the side. And then before you know it, it's like in production. And then when finally somebody figures it out, they're like, what? It works. So they're like, okay, fine. And then they new policy. That one app can live over there. And then everyone's like, well, why can't we do it? And then, ah, is what happens when you play with the good stuff. Hold on. And then this happens. Eventually, it just avalanche it's all over there. And the only reason you have on-prem is for dev and test. <laughs> like, well, we, we put a lot of money in it. We should use it for something. What about dev and test? <laughs> and then this is the funny part, is it's probably not even one cloud. Rogue groups are great at doing really havocy things. Well, you're in Google and in Amazon? OK, whatever. And then finally, there's the one. This is the one that affects probably more companies than and all of those others is this thing. You're, you have a good solid IT strategy when you're developing your code, you know the target, everything's solid, you're good to go, no tech debt, right? Then all of a sudden you require a company that's all in Amazon or in Azure. Okay, well, all right, we can deal with this, we can deal with this. We'll, we'll set up a migration plan, then you acquire another company that's in Google. You know, the funniest thing is Google did this to themselves. They acquired Waze. Guess what Waze doesn't run? Google Cloud. Because <laughs> they're like, uh, we can't migrate into that. They acquired Nest. Guess what they don't do? I mean, this is the thing. You know, this is like you acquire companies. You, gotta, you would just assume they'll have wonderful technical debt. So as a developer now, you have all these targets in all these different places. All right, fine, whatever. So this is where we're at. And then look, this is, this is the other thing that I think is hilarious is now companies are telling other companies what they can do. Walmart is telling all their vendors, you cannot run an Amazon. I was talking to a CTO last year, and this is scary. They, Amazon was explicitly mentioned in a contract for Walmart. You cannot run any of your infrastructure in Amazon if you're, if you're using it. It was a software as a service product. You have to run it in Azure or Google. So they ported up and they migrated, and they're now they're multi-cloud. So they can do business with like multi-million dollars worth of business with uh, uh, Walmart. So, <clears throat> okay, that's a lot of reasons. I don't think I have any more. And all of that I'm trying to tell you is, it's coming. And it's gonna come for good reasons. So how are you going to deal with it? Luckily, I have a plan. And a surprise, Apache Cassandra is breaking down the But, Apache Cassandra was built to do this. It was designed and built around the idea of just running anywhere all the time. It doesn't care. It's very agnostic. It doesn't, you want to run on prem, you want to run on Google, whatever. And as long as you have an x86 process of running a JVM, we're cool. <laughs> um, and it's actually working really well. So when you're in this multi data center architecture, there's some checkboxes you want to keep going. And this is whenever you've been forced into this world. You really need to help make some decisions. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, for the JVM, Oracle has recently made some licensing stuff. That's why we use the JDK. <laughs> so, so is it come uh, to that one, or do you need to procure that one separately? Uh, the JDK you use, we have a range of those you can use. If you want to pay Oracle for a JVM, that's fine. But OpenJDK works just great. Yeah, matter of fact, we ship with OpenJDK. So, yep. OpenJDK, I think, is going to overtake Oracle JVM, uh, mainly because Red Hat is pushing the button really hard on Shenandoah. Posis GV or Posis GC is cool. We are testing Posis GC a lot right now. It is scary good. 
I don't want to post any numbers because I'll probably embarrass myself. So if like it runs just like C++, zero is latency. Um, I think the days of GC latency issues are coming to a close. So um, anyway, so whenever you're going to deploy to multiple data centers, um, you know, I did, Derek mentioned I've made a lot of money on Oracle, but I'll tell you what I never got to make work right was running more than one data center. And the reason being is because it's not built to do that. And there's some things that you check off here, like this master list shared nothing architecture. It's critical. You can't have state that it requires like this leader that's going to run all these things across multiple data centers. It just doesn't work right there. Low latency, absolutely required. If you start spreading your data around the world, the higher latency you go farther away is not going to work for your customers. And this flexible get, you know, consistency guarantee is how you maintain control of your data no matter where it is. And that needs to be in the control of the developer and not some DBA. So let me talk about how some of this works. So share nothing, what does that give you? Again, that was some weird feedback here. Um, that was feedback from my... Sounds fine from here. Oh, it doesn't? Okay, maybe it's just my head. Um, didn't know what happened. Anybody else hear feedback? Okay. If I start squawking like a chicken, I'm sorry. All right, <laughs> been a long way. So this problem right here, nodes going offline. Now this is totally fine with Cassandra. Cassandra doesn't care when nodes are going up and down because it's built with Cassandra, and that's a normal operations issue. Um, most relational databases cannot stand that. If I if you're running a lot of relational databases, can I just walk into your data center and turn one off? Anyone I want? You're like, you get, you get a little nervous when I said that. And that's exactly the way you should feel with a relational database. Because even whenever you have a, like a cluster, like I, I used to run Rack, you be careful about which one you turn off. Because if you turn off the wrong one, it took a long time for it to rebuild quorum so you can do rollbacks. So it wouldn't do rollbacks for hours. So that means everything, every commit was being stalled, and eventually it would stop working. Rack, I made most money on the rack. <laughs> I have a beautiful house, by the way. But that's, uh, that's, that's part of the, the lie that's being built up around systems that aren't built to do that. And it's not just a lie, it's like they're trying to like throw things architecture on top of architecture that don't really work very well. Here's the one that I really love is what happens when Google goes down? Uh, it did, by the way. And it wasn't because of the infrastructure, it was their DNS server. And that means all of Google was offline for a while. Um, well, how do you handle that problem? An entire data center offline? That will happen. And I say this a lot. You have 0% chance of 100% uptime if you're not in more than one data center. I know, that's a whole lot of... What did you just say? It's like a ray of words. But putting it in a different way, put yourself in two data centers if you want a chance. Infrastructure sucks. Use a database that's okay with that. <laughs> Here's another problem. Latency. And this is kind of where we're at. 2019, global economy. We make money from everyone in the world, right? Well, you start out real strong. Oh, we're just in North America. Ooh, now we're in... EMEA in South America, and in India, and in China, and Australia, and now Africa, and oh man, our data is everywhere. And when that happens, guess what? If you're not near where the data is, your life sucks. So where do we put our data? Who, who, who gets the short end? Uh, do we leave it in North America? Well, here's the problem. This, you guys know where this is? You live here. This is a this, um, this thing is a problem for us in data engineers because of this problem. Light is too slow. <laughs> it takes 133 milliseconds for a photon to go around the Earth, unimpeded. And that is, I mean, that's a lot of milliseconds. But the reality is, is the round trip time between here and India is like 300 milliseconds over network, all right, if you're on an app, and let's say it's an Amazon East, and you're like clicking on things, 300 millisecond 
latency will pile up normal user apathy. Your data has to be where your customers are. And it has to be accurate and consistent. Isn't 300 milliseconds pretty fast now? It's like less than a second. You think. Build an app with a 300 millisecond lag just on their database. And so I will never allow an app, in the, well I never allowed apps into my infrastructure that had more than 100 millisecond latency on the database. So already you're three times over my budget. That is a really high latency for a single database call. And when you add up all the things that go in between, you're talking about 10 second page limits. It just doesn't work. That's why, that's why Amazon and Azure and Google are putting infrastructure where people are. Look at the caching infrastructure. For like uh, the AWS, their, uh, their caching infrastructure has edge points all over the place because those milliseconds count because they all, they're combined together. So this is actually a problem that we solve quite a bit. Oh yeah, and you can't speed up light. And the speed counts. So when you start talking about, this is an old graph, but it's still relevant, the slower your app is, the less conversion rate you get. And that is a problem because you, you pretty much are faced with no other choice at this point. You can't make light go any faster. And this is, my, this is what I love. Angry customers don't give you money. Happy customers give you money. <laughs> and that's the name of the game. So guarantees of consistency. Now this is more important for us as developers because now we're talking about, well, where's the integrity of my data? When you start spreading your data all over the world, this is the problem you're working on. This is, hey, oh great, I, I can replicate data all the time. I can use all kinds of replication schemes, but how is my data look? Okay, well, one of the things that Cassandra does really well is it has these consistency guarantees built into your database. So, for instance, we have weak consistency. This is, these are all things you can choose per query, read or write. So, I have weak consistency, which we call one. Um, it's for fast. And it gives, and there are data models that really work well with that. Time series data models, things like that, where I don't need, if there's a stale read at one point, I'm fine with that. And there's a lot more of those out there than you can imagine. Um, there's a great talk by Netflix. They use a lot of, uh, of the, they're all Cassandra actually, pretty much. And they talk about how they started picking through applications and how well they all, I mean, they were just fine working with one weak consistency. They get a lot of speed and it's more efficient. But when you need strong consistency, that's there as well. That's poor. 51% of the replicas have to acknowledge the right and be consistent with the read. If you're reading and writing at forum, you get strong consistency. That's a pretty good uh, consistency. But we also have exclusive consistency, meaning I can't put data in there without locking the database. That's a thing. You need that. Sure, that exists inside of Cassandra as well. So you have this range that you can work with now. And this is global, you, anywhere in the world. And each, and the farther down you go, the more latency is involved because it has to do more to, to protect your data. Um, now, I can see what's not on here is acid transactions. Yep. And anyone who sells you on distributed acid transactions is lying to you because Acid transactions have a certain quality that really are built around a single server because it has to be contained within that one sphere of influence. But what I can also say is that magically enough, I've built a lot of really important Cassandra implementations, like banks, um, where money is important. Um, other places where money is just important, it's not a bank, like my video. <laughs> my Netflix playlist is important. None of that's built on acid because it's not really required once you get into the requirements of the application. Now, you can argue with me on that, and I would love to do it, but this is kind of the shape of things, and this is where you learn how to do this. So when we connect, this is actual client code, and this is something I want to talk about, like how this actually looks as for a developer. So when you connect this, this top session right here, and I kind of don't like this slide anymore, I need to fix this kind of just throw up some code, I'll work on it. Well, if anybody has any suggestions, I'm always we're trying to make it better. But this, this CQL session just connects to a cluster in a key space. 
Not at any point do you say, oh, and only connect to this one node in this data center. No, this makes it very easy for a developer. If your code is all over the place, you just need to find one running node to connect to, and then it learns about the rest of the cluster. And whenever I'm doing statements, I'm creating prepared statements, which is you should be familiar with. Um, this is the same thing we do in SQL. Um, you can set the consistency levels and on the fly. I only, for this one I want quorum. This one I want local quorum. Let me explain what that means. So when you're in a single data center, strong consistency is very easy with using a quorum reader off of a quorum write. So 51% of the nodes inside of the cluster are green. And so this is a very simple, easy, single, this is like almost like asking with a single server. Strong consistency in a single data center is pretty easy because everything is kind of contained in the same data center. And of course, Cassandra is data center aware. So it means that all of that data is one cluster. In this case, we only have one data center. Here's the issue. When we get into this dual data center thing. So when we start talking about dual data centers, now the stakes are higher because we just slap a 70 millisecond latency between the data centers. This is actually pretty close to what you get from Amazon East to Amazon West. So <coughs> cross-country latency. So if I have 70 milliseconds of latency, that's in the middle. So you're not getting this instantaneousness. What do you do? Well, we're going to switch things around. And that's where there's some consistency guarantees that help you manage that and think you need to think about. So there is a, a version of Quorum called Local Quorum. And Local Quorum only looks at that single data center. Like I said, Cassandra's data center where it looks at that single data center and it sets up the quorum for just for the, the write request. It's only 51% of nodes in that data center. So it keeps it really the tightness on the latency. And then whenever I read at local quorum, that also, I'm sorry, local quorum, that read is also strongly consistent. But it's only happening inside of that data center, a data center one. But what's happening with data center two? Does that mean that data is not being replicated? Oh no. It's just that it's not a part of the quorum calculation. That data can be read and read at local quorum as well. And what's happening is this thing is constantly doing an async replication anyway. If you did a full quorum instead of a local quorum, then it would do 51% of the nodes in one data center and the other data center. So it's, you're just lumping up a lot more uh, latency inside this. This is a very, um, it's a very thoughtful way of handling multiple data centers. There's, the local keyword is used a lot in our consistency guarantees. And the reason being is because this is how you run an active-active configuration. Active active is kind of like the holy grail in a lot of applications. It's hard. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's very hard if you're using a relational database because where's when you do an update or an insert, where does that go? Selects are easy, read replicas are easy. But whenever you start mutating data, that's where active active gets a little dicey. But um, Cassandra's purpose built for that. As a matter of fact, some of the most successful large scale implementations are active active because they like out of time. Um, so who's doing this? Or why are they doing it, I should say. <clears throat> so let me talk, talk through some of the use cases. <coughs> How am I doing for time? Oh, perfect. Um, by the way, I have a live demo at the end of this. A little high wire app. I'm going to show you actually running code in those three data centers. Um, we got lots of clouds. So I'm going to show you some of the use cases here. But this is probably the primary one, and that's state management. Whenever you're running across multiple clouds, multiple data centers, on-prem, multiple cloud, this is the old classic hybrid cloud. We're in more than one cloud now. What do you do with state? Now, state management, if you push that state down into your data layer and let the data layer manage the replication, you are now in a place where you can comfortably work with your application. This is understanding how Cassandra does its replication, but it's also trusting that it does it well. So, this is my user, my user, <laughs> yay, stock, uh, the uh, clip art. But this is my user, it's, as you migrate around the world, and this happens to me all the time, right? I fly all over the place. But I'll tell you what, if I'm in England, and I pull up my Netflix, my playlist is still there. It remembers where I left off. Go team. Good, I don't have to watch that again. Stranger Things are awesome, but I don't need to watch it again. Um, but that, that state management is pushed down into the data layer. 
And this is, a, this is a, one of the easiest and probably the most useful use cases for Cassandra. Like I said, who's doing it? Well, Netflix, they talk a lot about it. Um, as a matter of fact, they'll be at Accelerate talking about this topic as well. They've been doing this, you see the, they've actually been doing this since 2013. Uh, so that's a long time. They, they haven't like broke it or anything. As a matter of fact, they're just more involved in it. And they have a lot of knowledge, this is good community knowledge out there, about how to run active active databases. And they actually run, because they're running active active, they run a lot less infrastructure than you. So there's some really interesting calculations on how, you, how much infrastructure you actually need. So when you're running active standby, which is one of my favorites, we're gonna create a whole data center that does nothing but suck electricity. That's the one that's gonna get shut down by your CFO. <laughs> remember, when, um, remember when Sony, uh, this is years and years ago, but when Sony PlayStation Network went down for 30 days because they got hacked? Wow, that was 2013. It was a long time. I mean, the fact that an entire site went down for 30 days and PlayStation is still popular, I am shocked by that, you know, go games. But they were down for 30 days. And you know who made that decision? Their CFO and their legal department. So the reason was because they didn't want to have to spend the money on twice as much Oracle. <laughs> so they didn't want to say, I have a second, second Oracle bill of stuff not doing anything. Well, they use a lot of Cassandra now. How about distributed microservices? This is a cool new use case. Um, I actually had a guy from Sky, uh, Sky TV do this very talk. This is actually how they're set up. They're an on-prem GCP and AWS. And what they're doing is they're set up a catalog of microservices in every, it's the same microservices deployed, of course, lots of keywords here, Kubernetes, <laughs> that sort of thing. But they're deploying the same microservices across all of these data centers. But what, what they're doing is they're driving that state down into the database. <coughs> so now when these microservices are deployed across all three of these different places, they all have the same data. So if I set data in AWS and I read it in GCP, it's all good. And it's really a fascinating. They can migrate, they can evacuate a data center. They can, if, they, if there's a problem, they can just shut it down. If they have a big event, um, like they talk about the Game of Thrones events, you know, because that happens, right? Um, when Game of Thrones is, is up, Everyone's doing something on Sunday night, right? Well, they have to gear up their infrastructure to do that. And they have to make sure it's close enough to where the people are to get good performance. And it's just how we manage these thundering herd problems. Um, Netflix, every year in December, spin up 20% more infrastructure. Why? Because all the kids are home. <laughs> My kid might be contributing to that. <laughs> and then finally, there's this one that I, I think this is becoming the problem that people are trying to solve is, all right, now that we've been told we're gonna to be moving, how do we do this? Or how are we paying down our technical debt? And the zero downtime migration. Um, I have helped with a couple of these, but this is actually pretty easy to do with Cassandra because of the way it works. So how do you do it? So let's say you have your standard stack of architecture running in a data center, and you're told you're gonna to run to a different cloud. Well, first thing you do, spin up another data center, in Google Cloud, and again, this is one cluster, one group of data, one logical group of data that just happened to have two data centers. This one, though, is now running in GCP. All the replication starts up, everything's good. Still no downtime over here. All that data is over there, all that's over here. You're now active, active, you could be. You spin up all your microservices in Google, turn on your DNS, everybody's happy. Did you know what file for? Uh, you can do a lot of different ways. Uh, the question was, is it running like the, the firewalls in the way or anything like that? This is the implementation details, but for sure. You want to make sure that you have the same access across each one. Um, but in a lot of, I actually gave a talk at reInvent. Um, if you were using Amazon, this is really what MPLS is made for. MPL, they have their Amazon Gateway product. So uh, I did a talk on really low level nerdy talk about MPLS, but that covers a lot of security problems. Because basically you're, you're extending your ethernet into Amazon. So, but it allows you to do that kind of seamless migration because the top layer is what you're worried about, the client layer. 
So you set up the same security, same ports. Uh, again, I, I should mention here, in all of these scenarios, DNS is one of the, kind of the unsung hero in a lot of these things. DNS should be the thing you look at for multi, uh, multi data center round world architecture. Because that's really where those requests need to be managed. Um, the reason Route 53 is such a big deal at Amazon is because it helps manage location data. Like, where are you in the world? Um, Dyn, another company that's doing quite well selling location based DNS services. So I know that when I'm in New York and I connect to certain services, I'm now, I'm not connecting back to the West Coast. I was in San Francisco yesterday. I was connecting there. So DNS is one of those things that's like so basic and everyone forgets about, but this is really how, one of the other things that make it work. I do have a talk about DNS, but it isn't too. Um, if you have your DNS game solid, and your data game solid, then you're just wearing apps. All right, all that and more. So don't forget, I told you I put it one more time. Uh, so uh, the Accelerate is gonna be in three weeks. I expect to see you there. <laughs> Anybody wanna go? No? I have some people already signed up today. Oh, we got some people in the back there. Again, this is gonna be talks, certification, boot camp. This is gonna be your one-stop shop. And there's gonna be some great talks, but also network. All the people that are doing this are gonna be there. And some of the people have been doing it for a long time. Uh, so there's going to be a bunch of people from Netflix. If you want to talk about active active, they love talking about it. What city is this? Like, Washington, D.C. Oh, no. It's just yeah. south of D.C. It's called uh, National Harbor, which is, okay. if, you, if you're in Washington, D.C., five minute Uber trip south, and there's this big convention center. It's massive. It's the same place as where Magnus is. And oh, yeah. Yeah, tons of there's tons of conventions there. Um, it is the convention area. Yeah. What hotel are people staying? There are well, the Gaylord has a hotel. If you so, I was telling someone today, if you don't want to leave a building for three days, you can stay at their hotel. But there are other options around there as well. It's kind of built around this infrastructure. You're gonna have an office. Don't get a hotel as far away from the site. You could, but yeah, don't. Yeah, just stay near. All right, I'm going to attempt the live demo, guys. Is everyone ready for this? Live demo. Uh, hang on. This is where we get crazy. I rarely do live demos because every time I do, I get feedback. I'm going to turn this off. It's OK. I have a big voice. <laughs> All right, hold on. Let me get this set up right. <laughs> Just a minute. I know. See, this is why I don't do live demos because everyone mocks me. No, oh, is that just you? Okay. All right. And this is what's going to make it weird. Okay. Okay. Sebastian wrote this, by the way, so let's give him a quick round of applause. Good job. So, <laughs> this is like the cooking show. You can do multi-club, but here's what I prepared earlier. <laughs> um, actually, this is real running infrastructure in Amazon, Google, and Azure. Uh, three of your favorite clouds, I'm sure. Hang on, let me figure out how I'm going to do this. That is the sound I kept hearing in my head. <coughs> Hi, Mom. It was through your headphones. Hi, Mom. Yeah. That should have corrected it. Okay. Eric, sound genius. Good job. I'll just speak a little louder. Okay, so this is what makes it super awkward is I have to point this way. But this is our Op Center product. Um, not a lot to say here, but other than it's a really convenient way to run a bunch of Cassandra clusters. Um, and also a good way to prove that I'm running in Amazon, Azure, and Google. These are really nodes running in there. How do I know that? Well, like, that IP address is 18.2. Who has an 18 dot? Amazon. I can show you all these nodes. They're all really there. I have no reason to hide this because it works so damn well. Um, but I have three data centers. This is one cluster. 
And we've set up this, we have this really cool little demo, and it's kind of fun because we get to blow things up on purpose. Chaos in the clouds. Now what makes this really interesting, I'm gonna stress you out, trigger warning. Amazon, Google, I mean, Azure, they can have outages at any moment. Isn't it better if you purposely destroy things to see how well your infrastructure works? You guys heard of the Chaos Monkey? That's a Netflix thing. Cute me. You know who stands up to the Chaos Monkey all the time? Cassandra. Like, whatever. <laughs> but this is what Netflix did years and years ago talked about this, and it made everyone go, ah. Is, is when you put code in production at, Amazon, at uh, Netflix, it, there's this Chaos Monkey running that will purposely bring down parts of it randomly in production during the day. Why? Because when you're a developer and you're expecting it, you build better code. Well, this is that same kind of thing, except we built it into a little app here. Um, what happens when bad things are happening? Now, we have purchases that are happening. The data center's all, right now, is running out of Amazon. That's our kind of our primary right now. So what happens when we bring down one node, okay? I'm gonna drop a node. Uh, so it's failing out a single node. It takes a while to refresh on this. That's, that's my downer on this. It takes a while for it to notice. But you'll see this happen in a second. So what it did, it just did a kill dash nine. Not a nice, gentle, hey, can you go up on this real quick? No, it was a kill dash nine. So right now, no tool, or they, the node just showed up like dead. Um, op center is like, whoa, bad things are happening. That was a Google. Well, all right, I don't think, single nodes are boring. <laughs> Eat that for lunch. Let's do this for real. Let's take down an entire data center. Now, I have it on good authority that the only data center this thing will knock out completely if I, if I click on this button. This is really hard to do backwards. <laughs> okay. This is like a test. How am I doing though, neuroscientist? Really bad, huh? All right, so when I say drop data center, it's gonna kill Amazon, okay? Awesome. Yes! We got an amen out there, all right? Watch, watch the data reads. All of a sudden now it's going to Azure. The application it reacted immediately. And why? Well, let's go back over here. Amazon's gonna start disappearing. <laughs> I know, that sounds great, doesn't it? Yep, it's gone. So, uh, just went, got a call from our rep at Amazon. They said they're a little outage. Uh, they're gonna be back any minute. You know what I don't care about? That. This is a real demo because this is actual, when we kill Dash 9, the entire Amazon data center. And let's go back. Oh yeah, transactions are still happening. It's all happening in Azure now. Google's kind of limping. Okay, but Azure's fine. This is, this is not that big of a trick, guys. This is not that hard. How long did it take you to write this? A weekend? A we couple days? A lot of help from other people, yeah. A lot of help. Actually, this started out as a thing called Chaos Cats. <laughs> and there's a guy, Russ Cats, who wrote this thing. It was just basically a group of scripts. Fire up. Um, the hero right now is, is uh, Op Center is able to do all the deployments. So Op Center can deploy to any cloud, it doesn't care. So really this is just a bunch of scripts around Op Center to deploy, but there's also some fun stuff in there because Op Center wants to be nice when it shuts down things. This is not nice. Kill Dash 9 is pretty harsh. But the demo is really meant to show you that this is easy enough. It's built to do this. We do it all the time. And I just walked into your data center and I turned off a random it. And everything is fine. You know when this is awesome? Three o'clock in the morning. That was the first time I ever used Cassandra in production is Amazon lost an entire um, availability zone on the weekend and I didn't know it until Monday morning. I came in and I was like, what's up with these nodes? Huh. Wait, like, oh, those were in that AZ that went offline. Huh, all right, we'll move them over here. The application didn't care. It was like, eh, they'll come back. Who 
we brought it back up, they synced, everything was done, no problem. That's the kind of world I want to live in because I'm tired of living in the 3 a.m. crying baby database. You know, that's exactly what it is too. So when we talk about hybrid cloud, yeah, there's a lot of buzzwords, ooh, hype. This is what makes me excited as a developer is I can develop apps that does do this. They're, they're really cool. Man, and you will look like a total rock star hero when you can pull this off. This is a fun demo to do in front of like demo day. Hey, we built an app. Oh, and we're gonna kill shit. <laughs> and people are like, whoa. So this is doable. All right, at that point, I think I'm done here. I'm gonna bring it back online while we ask you questions and answers, because I don't want you to think this is permanent, you know? Reset down nodes. All right, it's gonna bring them all back online. We'll, we'll bring up the, the screen. All right, let's, let's do some Q&A. Yes. Do you also have tests for network partitions when you're in linear as building mode, similar to the Jepson test from a few years ago? We do a lot of Jepson. We actually had a guy that was one of the largest contributors in Jepson working for us. He actually just left, unfortunately. Um, he's, he went to a really nice place. <laughs> but um, yeah, we do a lot of Jepson testing. And we're, we actually add a lot to the open source project based on that testing. Um, it's, distributed systems are super hard. Yeah, and, uh, but we've been doing, as a matter of fact, um, I was involved in a lot of the early Jepson testing. If you go look at some of Kyle's blogs, you'll see my name in there a lot, because he and I spent a lot of time on Skype. And, uh, but 2.0 is when we really started doing Jepson testing. We're getting ready to ship 4.0, Cassandra. Uh, I'm pretty happy with where it is. It'll never be perfect, but we sure get close. Yeah. Anybody else? I love that you just go right into the throat. <laughs> yeah. CockroachDB is a leader follower architecture and it's based loosely on Spanner. Very different architecture completely. Uh, Cockroach, yeah, has when you're doing like distributed transactions like that, there's a certain cost, to it, which is you have some really weird syntax you have to deal with, the way that you add data to the database, but also in the way that it manages like failure, the failure. Like it's, it's a consistent, fully consistent database. So if you can't manage consistency, it just fails. There's no, it's not going to do that. Where you have, when you have the tunable consistency with Cassandra, you can say, well, there's certain parts of my application that are absolutely fine that don't need that level of strong consistency. And I, you know, I think there are plenty of cases where you do need that, and that's fine. I mean, relational databases will not go away. There's a reason for them to be around. But I'm saying most of the applications I'm using today, like if I look at my phone, don't need that level of consistency. You also pay baseline links to get that for every request. Yeah, yeah, it's like using asset on every single request. Do you really need that when you're just adding records or doing time series or something like that? Yeah. yeah. Could you use Cassandra for asset, the real asset thing, that the whole backing Cassandra kind of thing? So it can be done, I guess. But how well do you provide this? Oh, that's right. So with, with decoupled, we'll do two things. Banks don't use asset transactions. Okay. Yeah. That, and banks could use asset transactions. Yeah. But, yeah. whoa. Is that a bomb? <laughs> 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 what is leave right there? <laughs> the drugs. The drugs. OK, sorry. Uh, for asset transactions, those limited use cases, no, we don't do asset transactions. But we do have strong or exclusive transactions, which means if I need to set a record and be the only one setting it, we allow for that. That's what we call it. For distributed, I mean, for the single investor, probably it's easy, but how about distributed? For asset, is it, I mean, kind of Yeah, we don't do anything acid. And acid generally means commit rollback type thing. Yeah, we don't do that. We do, we look at things in a continuum, so serialized connections. So one of the things, for instance, like bank balances. Bank balances, if, you're, if your bank uses a commit rollback on a bank balance transaction, that's a disaster waiting to happen. NBCC doesn't work that good. Um, the way that banks work, and I've done this a lot, is they work with lenders. And so, and this goes all the way back to mainframes, because most people are probably still using them. 
So I want to know all the transactions that are happening to each account. So this account has, I subtracted money from it at this time scale. And at this bank account, I've added money at this time scale. I want to resolve those two things along a time scale. That's what a ledger data model is all about. That's why a lot of financial institutions use Cassandra, because it doesn't go down and it doesn't lose data. And so those important things are really critical. Now, if you do have a commit rollback, Situation, sure, use a relational database. But what you're, what you're saying is, I also don't need the uptime and the distributed part of that data, um, which is that works. Too. I mean, if you, that's what you don't need, then why complicate matters with the distributed database? Because it is more complicated. Yeah, right. I run my SQL on my laptop. It's great for you know when I'm looking through data, I run my SQL like an end SQL. Yeah, around payments and. Ledgers and transactions, and I've done some work with a couple of and they had a big bank in Brazil with the sound of this type of use cases. I have a little demo that yeah. I can share with the authors on how to do that. Just sitting on GitHub, you can see some of the light transactions well, but that is cool. The big, the big thing I like in banking right now is retail banking because it, not 20 years ago, banks were like nine to four. <laughs> they actually shut down at night. Remember that? Again, they have batch mode at night. Now, I can check my bank balance anywhere in the world, 24-7, and that's what I expect. Retail banking is changing. So, they're how much can withdraw, how much can they have? Yeah, I think that's how they Banks have built a business around eventual consistency. Yeah, that's right. Overdrafts, over, over fees, like, but when I mentioned that one time, I was in it, I was working with a bunch of CIOs at bank. They had a group of CIOs, I know, right? <laughs> When I said that, they all like did the evil laugh. Ha! Oh, well, we'll just move on. <laughs> did, I, did I say something I should have? Oh, look, those are coming back online. Yay! All right, more questions. Yes. Um, so I was just kind of a question, but I was like, the, it sounds like um, um, that the cloud system is very uh, secure. Like it has very good security. So like, is it like, it's like not, nothing can like really break into it or something? Uh, well, it's just vulnerable to people that install it. Um, for our data sex enterprise, uh, we go through all of those standard compliance for what, what you need, but then it's up to the implementer to make sure that you like turn on the passwords and things like that. Um, we have certain tools in our enterprise product, like auditing and encryption and things like that, that when you need a higher level of security, that's one of the things we add into Cassandra, um, is all those tickets. but. Like anything, I think I've seen some really secure systems get pretty stupid with password as a password. <laughs> More questions? Yeah. What the limitation? How many data center it handles? It, it, it looks like data center popping up every day, now like everywhere. What the? Uh, What's the limits? Yeah. Well, uh, the limits. Well, first of all, it's a different way of programming. The data modeling is very different. So, uh, if Let's say you build an application using a relational database and you're fine with that. I mean, this is going to be a big change for you. So there's some technical debt already. For physical limitations, uh, not being able to do joins, if that's a requirement, you can't do a join. Um, we have an enterprise product that does it using Spark, but that's an analytics job. So that's a limit. You can't do it. When you build your data models, they have to be very denormalized. Um, when it comes to sizing, uh, it's not a really good, it's not a data warehouse. And I think that's really important, is it's a transactional database. So I, I see a lot of people get into trouble when they think, well, it's a big data system. I can turn this into a data warehouse uh, because it'll store petabytes of data. But it's not the right use case for that because you're, you're spending a lot of money on fast transactional data when you could probably be just fine using something like S3 and Presto. You know, that's, that's a huge limitation whenever you're spending money. If you put a petabyte of data on a Cassandra cluster, the reason you put a petabyte of data on a Cassandra cluster is because you need a millisecond access to it. If you don't need it in a millisecond, then store it on something else. Parquet is awesome. <laughs> you how many data centers? Oh, how many data centers? That was one of the questions I had. Uh, it's pretty unlimited, but you, the restrictions are going to be 
more physical limitations like how much network latency bandwidth. Um, having more than a few, you need to start thinking about things like network bandwidth and because you're going to be replicating a lot or how you do your replication strategy because that could generate a lot of bandwidth. I've seen, I think the most I've seen people put in production is five, five data centers. I have seen some stupid implementations uh, of 300 data centers, but that was, it was a data center per store. They were distributing data through every store, so they deployed a small cluster, or small cl a cluster of small nodes in each data center, and they used a natural built-in debt replication times 300, but it was only a few gigs of data, but um, still, that was kind of stupid. <laughs> I was like, really want to do this? Can you do a talk and accelerate? <laughs> Sorry, I misread the question. Yeah. Is a queuing system used for this? Uh, to feed like events to all of the uh, nodes? Yeah, I, I know nothing about it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so like, how do they communicate with each other? Oh, how, how do you keep them in sync? Is it not the same as how much? No, no, it's not. And what it is is every every write that goes to a coordinator is asynchronously copied to the other replicas. So, oh, that killed me. I know. I guess we don't need to see that. Oh, well, asynchronous. So whenever you write data into the system, it automatically uh, asynchronously copies to the other replicas. There's no queuing mechanism. There's no, uh, what, like on MySQL, there's that slave lag. Uh, number that's out there, we don't have any of that stuff. If it doesn't, if it's not moving data around, then there's something very bad, and it creates what's called hints. So you start seeing things, that, that's an error condition. You need to start troubleshooting that. Um, but it's all asynchronous, and the, the coordination is another protocol called gossip. And that, and what that is, and that's a funny name, but it actually is what it is. So when you add or delete nodes out of the system, it's, this is how the cluster coordinates with all the other nodes. Each node has basically knowledge of all the other nodes, and they store a certain range of data, and they're all in sync. What's also cool is the driver, when it connects to the cluster, that, that one cluster build command also participates in gossip. So when it connects to the cluster, like I said, you only need to connect to one running node, and then it'll figure out the rest. It gets that table of information, like here are all the nodes in the world, here's where they are, Here's all the data that they have. And now the, the driver is participating in that as well. And that makes it really cool for developers because you don't have to think about optimization at that point. It starts optimizing all the connections to all the nodes anyway. So, so that means there's no single point of data. Exactly. That, that demo that I just ran, the reason it went right over like that is because it tried to do a read. And it's like, I didn't get anything back within a certain time frame, like a second. So I'll just try the next one. And it'll, it'll just walk around. Yeah, you got anything? Oh, uh, hold over here. We, have, we also have this rapid read protection where it will, if it gets absolutely nothing in a, in a very short, it actually does two requests at the same time. So it'll get one of them back and not the other. So there's these like really optimistic, really neat things that you can do to make your application 100%. And if it gets the feedback from Google, then it just drops. Well, if something goes offline, I mean, I mean, like, you know, if it's sending a request to Google, it gets replied, let's say it's the same, basically it just drops one. And well, that's where the consistency comes in. So if you're looking for quorum or one, or you're asking how much, how much consistency do I need in my data, and that's as a developer, you get paid that. So if you say one, I only need one replica's worth of information. I'm fine with whoever gives it to me. If you're saying quorum, you need 51% of the replicas. So if you're a replication factor of three, I mean, two of the nodes need to reply with consistent data. And when they do, finds that. And then, that's why it's strong consistency. You don't get this chance like you get two responses and they're not right. That sets up an, an error correction, so it actually goes and tries to prepare that data behind the scene. It will figure out the right answer and then give you the right answer. Or if it fails, it'll say, I'm sorry, I can't satisfy consistency in that to prepare. That's more of a, I did something really bad in my cluster moment. <laughs> and probably like the first couple of weeks you're doing, you're trying out new things with Cassandra, and you just do some bad stuff. Like, oh, well, let's make everything rack aware. <laughs> so yeah, and that's when you get on the forums, you ask questions, and we, we answer, it's like, oh, do this, and then you're happy. <laughs> yeah. 
How does it move? How fast does it move the data? Yeah, like how fast does it move the data? Like how quickly is the, is the refresh rate? Like how quickly does it communicate with databases and the data itself? So when you write data into a coordinator, it's as fast as wire speed is, is like how fast the data gets to the other place. If you write a quorum, that means that you have a commit to disk on two of those three nodes. So that that has to happen. It's not just I'm going to put it out there and a coordinator is going to just take care of it. No, I get, I'm getting an acknowledgement of two disk commits. So again, as a developer, you get to pick that answer. What do you need? If you're okay with whatever, then just do a write of one, and the other two nodes will be synchronized. And it's how fast wire speed. How fast can it get there? There's nothing that's blocking it other than just network. So milliseconds. Yeah, that's that's why whenever we have multiple data centers, you start thinking about the word local in front of the quorum. So you're not putting that 70 millisecond, 100 millisecond of latency in between that quorum judgment. You're keeping it local. So in the microseconds. Yeah. I was just concerned for overcome the GPR garbage collection issue. Oh, lots of things. Um, <laughs> garbage collection, all right, so in general, garbage collection issues are fairly rare. When they do happen, they're usually something that, like in the data model, that's been broken. Um, we do have those problems, but I think there's a lot of FUD, you know, fear and certainly a doubt about, oh, you got to tune the GDM. You have to be a GDM expert. No, you're done. And uh, I there's usually two reasons your JVM will start acting poorly. Uh, you're doing something really unusual that we can fix with the data model, like it, it's putting a hotspot, or something really rudimentary, like your disks are not working. And the reason being, and this is kind of a funny, every time I've had a JVM issue, it's been a disk. Why? Because there's a mem table in Cassandra. And when it writes data, it stores it in the mem table. But then uh, when the mem table gets to a certain full point, like it fills up, and that's your JDM memory, it flushes out to the disk. Well, if it can't flush to the disk, then it starts filling up your memory. Then you start getting PCs. And that's like an error condition. That's red alert. Bad things are happening on your cluster. And then the disk. So um, I mentioned the Shenandoah and the, uh, the ZGC, which is like the next generation of garbage collection. The testing we've done. Even that doesn't cause any problems anymore because they're really there's a large group of people that are working on zero latency garbage collection. And um, our we so in DataSec Enterprise we use a really kind of a more modern way of writing Java code using that thread per core. So we do multi-thread and like, um, load the threads per core. Um, it creates an enormous relief to the memory loading because it's not having to context switching to move memory around as much. We also get a lot of efficiency out of the caching. So I think you'll notice that most of the stuff lately, especially in the past couple of years, is just really light on the JVM. We have a lot of other things, but we get it. we've been using JVM for over 10 years. We're still successful. <laughs> Anything else? You don't know. 
And it's, it keeps up with those hundreds and millions of, of transactions per second that you potentially get based on the amount of volume you have. But the time series, the way that it stores the data time series, is really superior. So that, There's a lot of them in China. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because um, here's the funny story, and I think that was our last one, right? Yeah. Here's the, here's the funny story to end the night. Uh, we have a solution architect who's from China, and he was going to China to work with uh, one of the big cloud companies, uh, the Cassandra Exploration. Well, we have a lot of videos that we create, uh, like how to run Cassandra. And he's like, dude, they can't get to them because of the firewall. So we loaded him up, <laughs> just full of all the videos, and sent him off to China. <laughs> and so he showed up, and, and he's like, here, guys, all of a sudden now, my image is all over China. I, I, I can't wait to go to China now, because now everyone knows me from Cassandra. This is like our old 201, 220. Uh, classes, but he gave it to them and somehow it got disseminated. So now there's a lot of people that are learning about Cassandra from these bootleg DSX videos. Now you made this. Yeah, I think so. So I was not going to go to China. I got it in China now. Yeah, huge China. Huge. <laughs> that is all the time we have now for questions. However, Patrick is here for a one on one question after we do the, the raffle giveaway. So you feel free to hold those questions and come up and ask right after the raffle. Uh, before I do the raffle, I want to give a great big round of applause, Patrick McFadden.